This is the second of two lectures on Rene Descartes and his metaphysics, but this one is focused on the question of the animal and what happens to the animal in Cartesian thought. Um, but it's also an essay uh, or talk on, uh, on, on linguistics and, and the development of Cartesian linguistics, linguistics and the subsequent development of uh, neo-Cartesian linguistics, which are so uh, prevalent in American universities today. So that when linguistics are taught in American university today, they're often taught in this neo-Cartesian paradigm, uh, particularly as influenced by Noam Chomsky, one that, that I find myself to be somewhat problematic. I uh, one, but uh, whether you affirm it or, or not, it's certainly uh, uh, diametrically uh, uh, opposed to the thinking about language that we find in deconstructive theorists like uh, Derrida, Foucault, Sixou, uh, and certainly uh, the thought of uh, Heidegger. Um, so um, we're going to get deeper into, uh, as this some of these uh, uh, lectures evolve, we're going to get deeper into th questions of animality in Derrida, questions of language in, in metaphysics in Heidegger. Um, but uh, uh, to do that, we're, we're, we're looking at first here what what uh, 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 post-structuralist um, deconstructive uh, orientations to language or not, or what they're in, in effect responding to and reacting against, and that is the uh, the Cartesian view about language. Uh, and 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 uh, and today, uh, I mean, in the case of Derrida, for instance, he very rarely commented on. Uh, Chomsky, uh, he does a couple of times here or there, um, but uh, uh, Chomsky has a lot to say about Derrida. A lot of it is very scathing, and uh, it, it, it's as, uh, as scathing as it is uninformed, unfortunately, because he, I don't think he has, uh, either he's deliberately not wanting to read the thought of Derrida or he uh, just simply doesn't understand it. I, I don't know which. Uh, but, but nonetheless, he speaks authoritatively and makes the most uh, outrageous claims that have no basis in uh, any particular uh, study that he's done of Derrida's text. But, but in any case, this, this will give you a sense of what the uh, neo-Cartesian view is and how it's linked to the question of animals and, and animality. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm entitling this talk, um, Cartesian linguistics and the animal. We'll look at the question of how uh, we're going to see is how Descartes construes the animal as a machine and uh, a machine without logos, where we can say, well, man is a, a machine with uh, with reason. Animal is a machine without reason. We're both uh, machines, but one is lacking in this faculty. It's going to be very similar to the view. Chomsky, who's going to see animals as lacking this organ that he's going to call, or this alleged organ, theodically uh, the, uh, uh, asserted organ that he calls UG, uh, universal grammar. Okay, um, so let's recall the Aristotelian definition of man as man is the rational animal. We'll be, we've been working with that already. We'll continue to work with that definition because that, that is the definition of man handed down to us from antiquity. And in its most similar, uh, simple formulation, we could say it's logos plus animality equals man or reason plus animality equals man. And Descartes was going to call common sense plus animality equals man, this faculty that human beings have but animals don't seem to have. Um, now, Descartes, does Descartes evade this definition? Does he uh, give us a different definition of man? Um, not really. We're going to see he ends up reinforcing this uh, traditional definition of man, although he's reacting against um, Aristotelian articulations of Christian thought, as we've already uh, said in the last lecture. Um, but he he doesn't you know what what we'll see is that he doesn't he he does on the one hand he doesn't say that man is not the rational animal he simply sort of decides not to decide uh, about this question and we'll we'll look at his his language when he makes this uh, 
uh, when he sort of suspend, leaves the question in suspense. This is something that a theme that Derrida will pick up on. Um, okay, so let's start though with the Cartesian view of reason, logos, common sense. This is from the very first pages of Discourse on Method. This is what he's calling common sense. He says, good sense is the most evenly shared thing in the world for each of us thinks he is so well endowed with it that even those of us who are the hardest to please in all other respects are not in the habit of wanting more of it than they have. It is unlikely that everyone is mistaken in this. It indicates rather that the capacity to judge correctly and to distinguish the true from the false, what is properly called common sense or reason is naturally equal in all men. For uh, as for good sense or reason, it is the only thing which makes us men and distinguishes us from the animals. So there's some pretty, those are pretty revealing passages about what he thinks reason is and also the place of animal that, that exists in, uh, in his thought. Okay, so, but if we um, go back, I'll note in passing here what he's calling the ability, the capacity to judge correctly. Again, we're calling, remember, truth becomes correct perception in Descartes, the, 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 the correct perception of the objective form in the empirical external world. And, um, and, and it's, uh, opposites, what he called, what he's talking about here is distinguishing between the true and the false. Remember, we said that, uh, the, the, the correct perception, its opposite would be the false or incorrect perception, say competence, incompetence. The, uh, 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 but in the case of the, uh, the more ancient Greek notion of truth that precedes this one, you know, we call this aletheia, which the, uh, which means unconcealment. Heideggerian terms, the unconcealment of the being of beings, and, and its opposite would be rather not the false, but but forgetting. This is something we'll have to uh, come back to. I uh, have a picture there of a uh, of an ass. Uh, uh, golden ass is the Apuleius, uh, wonderful novel by Apuleius, where Lucius, the main uh, character, the narrator, finds himself transformed into an ass. Slater becomes the uh, the uh, uh, inspiration for Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, where Bottom is an ass. And so the ass is an interesting figure in the history of Western uh, literature and philosophy. I think St. Francis called his body Brother Ass. Uh, so we have the body that is Brother Ass, and we have this, some, this other divine part of our soul, which we've been describing as, uh, as logos. But the poor ass doesn't really fare well. Uh, in uh, uh, in Western literature and thought, he becomes a figure of of abuse. But in uh, in in, uh, in Apuleius's Golden Ass, a, co a delightfully comical figure. Okay, so we, we in the last lecture we talked about how the pineal gland is construed in Descartes as a kind of a transubstantiated seed, the doctrine of transubstantiation, and in uh, Thomas thought is when that was when. Uh, the the what exists in the realm of of becoming is uh, is transformed or undergoes goes a transformation into something metaphysical or divine. Uh, the transubstantiation in Christian theology is linked to the uh, the Eucharist when the priest consecrates the elements. The ordinary bread becomes quite literally the uh, body of Christ. Uh, the wine becomes the blood of Christ. This doctrine is uh, rejected in the uh, in the Protestant traditions in which the um, wafer and the, and the grape juice or wine are, are tokens or symbols of remembrance of Christ, but in the Catholic tradition, they're quite literally transformed into something metaphysical. Uh, and this is what, uh, what Descartes is claiming about the pineal gland in the brain. It's also one of the reasons why his thinking is, is metaphysical. You see that on the right. You see that sort of, again, that pineal gland in the center that he believed was there in the head. Ne never found it. Hasn't been found yet in any more than Chom what Chomsky calls uh, universal grammar. UG said to be lodged in the genome. Uh, Chomsky makes claims to being a brain scientist rather than a philosopher. No one has found it. His UG lodged in the genome any more than they have found, than, than Descartes ever found the pineal gland with the, uh, or this, the place within the pineal gland said, that's said to be uh, the divine seed. Um, here's a little comic there, which uh, uh, I think is kind of funny, but it sums it up quite, uh, quite nicely. God looking at the uh, figure there that would be the Cartesian view. 
finding it somewhat problematic. Okay, uh, so in the case of Descartes, we said he rejected the uh, he he rejected the scholastic uh, uh, you know the, the 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 all you know the hundreds of years of. Uh, of, of uh, you know belief in or, or in a study book study uh, that he he became very suspicious of and he's uh, you know he he's he's not interested in reading books as we've said he wasn't interested he he, he spent seven years exploring the book of life before he made this uh, turn inward but when he does investigate books the books that he is interested in aren't books we might think about in a conventional sense let's let's uh, read he says so i thought that the knowledge we acquire in books at least that based on reasoning which is only probable and for which there is no proof being composed and enlarged little by little by the opinions of many different people does not approach truth as closely as the simple reasoning of a man of good sense concerning the things which he meets all right, so Descartes' books, as we can see, he, you know, he, he was reputed to have carcasses of animals, you know, suspended from the rafters of his room that he cut open, and these, these were the books that he that he that that inspired him, and he became obsessed with finding, you know, how the body functioned, and, and came to the conclusion that the animal body was a magnificent machine that God had created and that our bodies too were magnificent machines. Um, remember we said that the, that the organ, the brain had not been discovered, uh, you know, prior to this period. Uh, it was, it wasn't thought to be, there was thought to be, you know, just kind of goo, he said in the, uh, in, in, in the skull or, you know, bats in the belfry. It was just kind of an empty vessel. Many people viewed it as such. Uh, but this, this was the period when the, when the old uh, uh, ancient taboo against, Opening up the body, the human body especially, and investigating it uh, was was discarded. And we have the you know this is a period of scientific discovery, but that began with the discovery of of what is on the what is on the inside, the mystery of what's on the inside of the body. Um, and so for Descartes, the animal body, he's going to conclude as a kind of a machine. All right, so let's uh, read. He says this will not appear in any way strange to those who, knowing how many different automata. Our moving machines, the industry of man can devise using only a very few pieces by comparison with the great multitude of bones, muscles, nerves, arteries, veins, and all the other parts which are in the body of every animal. We'll consider this body as a machine, which having been made by the hands of God is incomparably better ordered and has in it more admirable movements than any of those which can be invented by man. All right, and that's that kind of platonic distinction again. You know, so we have the machine made by man, which is a copy of the copy. But man, God is the great uh, machine maker, and the machine that He makes is is you and I, also the machine of the animal. But these are machines with a difference because some machines are endowed with this mystical seed that He's calling reason, uh, but describing as a kind of a, uh, or, or thinking about as a kind of a. Uh, a, 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 an organ lodged in the brain, much like Plato thought of the, the fire that burned at the center of the armillary sphere, sphere and the, the logos, which he called described as the logos. Um, uh, but animals are again, lacking in that seed or that organ, uh, or in Chomsky in terms, UG, universal grammar. Okay, so uh, let's go on. Now we want to focus for a minute on, so the, if the animal is a machine, uh, we want to talk a bit about what, what comes to be known in contemporary linguistic theory. Um, it's called recursion, but it's taken. This is not a word used by Descartes, um, but it's a word that is inspired by Descartes articulation of human animal differences. And so it's a key term you need to focus on. It's one of the most important terms in Chomsky's theory of linguistics. Or his orient, his philos, his what I'm going to be calling a philosophy of language, rather than, as he claims, a biolinguistic brain science. Um, okay, if there were such machines which had the organs and appearance of a monkey, or of some other irrational animal, we would have no means of recognizing that they were not of exactly the same nature as these animals. Instead of which, if there were machines which had a likeness to our bodies and imitated uh, our actions in as much as this were morally possible, we would still have fair, uh, two very different ways, means of doing this. Okay, now note here again, the conflation of 
the uh, the the animal and the machine. And so, so the animals and machines are uh, are, are similar. Um, they're they're uh, we could say they're both construed as copies of a copy. We want to think of it in terms of the logic of the dangerous supplement that we uh, discussed previously. Um, the machine that is the human being again is is a copy, but it has this divine seed uh, within it. Now, in the case of human beings, of, of man, um, we have two ways of knowing whether or not if, if somebody could possibly make Chomsky is going to say a robot that that was, um, uh, you know, so well made that it fooled us into believing that it was a human being because it looks so much like a human being that we were unable to tell the difference, he's going to say, we still have two ways of figuring this out of figuring out if the robot is real or not. Okay. Two means a certain means of recognizing that these robots were not for all that real men. Okay? Of these, the first is that they could never use words or other signs, composing them as we do to declare our thoughts to others. For the robotic machine may, and it may not, this is my editing those words, there may not arrange words in various ways to reply to the sense of everything that is said in its presence in the way that the most unintelligent men can do. All right, now what he's calling, what he's describing here is what comes to be known in contemporary linguistic theory as recursion, okay, which is the, uh, again, um, the ability to, uh, to compose words or arrange words in multiple ways to reply to, uh, and to the sense of everything that is said in its presence in the way that the most unintelligent of men can do. Now, this question of reply, um, we'll come back to later and, and when we read Derrida's uh, The Animal That Therefore I Am, because here what we're really talking about is the ability to respond uh, and, and to respond in a creative ways is, is uh, called recursion. But this question is, do animals respond? Um, this is going to be an important theme we need to uh uh, reflect upon. Okay, so what is Cartesian recursion? Um, here's Chomsky's uh, summarizing of it. it says, the rules of grammar must reiterate, must iterate, which is to repeat, in some manner to generate an infinite number of sentences, each with its specific sound, structure, and meaning. We make we uh, we make use of this recursive property of grammar constantly in everyday life. We construct new sentences freely and use them on appropriate occasions. So as you can see, the neo-Cartesian linguists are going to really jump on this uh, distinction that uh, Descartes makes and uh, between you know humans and animals and, and humans and robots here in this case that uh, that that is going to that, that, that they're going to affirm and say is is certainly true of human animal differences. So there's a lot of ways in which contemporary thinking about language, the Chomsky and Neo, Chom uh, the Neo-Cartesian Chomsky and paradigms really reaffirm uh, human animal distinctions that we're gonna see Derrida deconstructing in his animal that therefore I am. Okay, animal behavior is typically regarded uh, by the Cartesians. This is uh, Chomsky writing here. Animal behavior is typically regarded by the Cartesians as unbounded, but not stimulus free and hence not creative in the sense of human speech. The unboundedness of human speech is an entirely different matter, say from that of animals, uh, because of the freedom from stimulus control and the appropriateness to new uh, situations. Modern studies of animal communication so far offer no counter evidence to the Cartesian assumption that human language is based on an entirely distinct principle. Okay, now it's precisely this claim of Chomsky that is going to inspire uh, many in the years to follow, let's say, the publication of the structural, uh, his book on uh, syntax. Um, that uh, uh, to, to, to see if this is really true by trying to, for instance, teach apes how to speak or studying can, and, you know, can, can, it, can you get an ape to sign? And what would this, if that were the case, what would this imply about the claim that's being made here that, uh, there, that there's no really convincing counter evidence to Descartes' assumption that uh, human language is based on an entirely distinct principle, which he's calling here recursion, okay? Now, so in this paradigm, in, in the Cartesian paradigm, one of the things we want to underscore is that animals are essentially mere machines, that this is a hierarchical 
uh, de uh, description of animals, much like we saw when we talked about the logic of the dangerous supplement with Plato uh, the different, and speaking writing uh, differences that we can say here that animals come to be effectively scapegoated in this system. And this, and a, one, the word for this, Derrida is kind of somewhat playfully an animal, therefore I am going to, to play around with this idea of what he calls carno fallo logocentrism. So we've already talked about fallo logocentrism or logocentrism being inherently um, gendered in a particular way that is uh, possibly, well, not possibly, I mean, is misogynistic. Uh, but a uh, carno is is referring to uh, the place of the animal in the system who comes to be scapegoated much like woman in this uh, logocentric system we've been discussing. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, okay, let's let's go on. So Descartes's going to say the second means of, and I'm going to put a little uh, clarification here. The second means of determining if the robot is not a real man is that although they, these robots may do many things as well, or perhaps even better than any of us, they would fail without a doubt in others, whereby one would discover that they did not act through knowledge, but simply through the disposition of their organs. Okay. All right. Now, by these two same means, one can also tell the difference between men and beasts, for it is particularly noteworthy that there are no men so dull-witted and stupid, not even imbeciles, who are incapable of arranging together different words and of composing discourse by which to make their thoughts understood, and that on the contrary, there is no animal, however perfect and whatever excellent dispositions it has at its birth, which can do the same. Um, okay, and, and this shows us the, uh, not only that animals have less reason than men, but that they have none at all. Okay, animals do not have a mind. They don't have logos, reason, language, the mystical seed, uh, in, the, in the pineal gland in the brain. They don't have UG, whatever you want to talk about this. It's nature, it is, uh, it is nature which acts in them and according to the disposition of their organs. Okay, so I think that I think this should be sufficiently uh, clear. Uh, and now um, uh, I want to ask a, a, a yet another question here before we move on to, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Chomskyan, uh, you know, linguistics in comparison with uh, what we've been discussing so far. Uh, but let's be clear that I'm asking here, do dolphins or apes have their own languages? And uh, Descartes, you know, makes really clear that, that, that this would not be the case. Uh, he's going to say, one should not confuse words with the natural movements, which bear witness to the passions and can be imitated by machines as well as by animals. Neither should one think, as did certain of the ancients, that animals speak, although we do not understand their language. Okay, so these, these are certainly questions that are uh, still being debated today. Um, I don't want to suggest what the right answer is to any of these questions, um, but I do encourage you to look, look into them. Um, well, on the left there, you see uh, Central Washington University, not far from where I am at Western Washington University, had for years a symposium. I think, unfortunately, it's no longer uh, in business, but uh, they sought there to teach uh, apes to do signing, and you could go at one time. You could go and observe this, um, but you'll find out information about this if you if you look into it further. There was also an interesting film called uh, Project Nim uh, about a, a, an ape who was named Nim Chimsky that was lived lived with a family. Uh, kind of, I think the the fate of that particular ape was not a particularly happy one. But uh, it's it's worth that's also a wor worth worth uh, looking at as well. These are just instances of experiments where people have tried to put these claims that Chomsky has made to the test and to uh, disprove them. Okay, now um, let's let's continue. So Descartes is, uh, you know, one question that we need to ask about animals also is, you know, do do they have souls? Okay, now I think this is a particularly um, interesting question in light of because what I think is one of the things that we're going to see is that is that really one of the reasons why it's worth pausing on Descartes is and really knowing Descartes well is not only to understand contemporary critical theory and to be able to read Heidegger and Derrida, for instance, but 
um, to, uh, it, it's, it's crucial to understand that with the thinking of Descartes comes a fundamental transformation in humanity's orientation to the uh, animal, which for instance leads to the advent of factory farming. Because if, for instance, you know, if, if the animal is merely a machine, um, then that machine can be used in whatever way that one sees uh, fit. Uh, I think it's Chomsky that, or uh, Nietzsche that's going to refer to the uh, animal as, as a providential machine or a machine that is uh, uh, that providence has provided for us. Uh, and I think he's being ironic there, but a, but but a machine that providence has provided for our uh, well-being. Well, our ans- our animals providential machines that are there for our uh, well-being. Um, or can they be treated for, can they be dismantled in the way that you might dismantle a car engine or a bicycle? Um, or do, or do animals have feelings? And one of the questions we're going to see uh, Derrida addressing in, um, uh, the animal therefore I am is that the, the crucial question might not be, you know, do animals, um, you know, think, do they speak, do they have language, but do animals suffer? This is a question raised by Jeremy Bentham that uh, Derrida will explore. Uh, but if, uh, uh, what, 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 what I think it's worth pausing for a minute on what would be, what the implications would be if it were actually true that animals did uh, suffer and, and which question is the most uh, crucial? Do animals have language or do they, uh, uh, do they, do they suffer? Um, in the case of Chomsky, uh, excuse me, of, uh, well, Chomsky and of, of Descartes, um, this throws into uh, question the whole um, problem of the soul of the animal. Let's, let's look at what Descartes says. He says, the reasonable soul uh, could not in any way be derived from the power of matter. Now, this is a view he articulates against Aristotle, but it must be created expressly uh, which he's referring here to recursion. Uh, there is nothing uh, which leads feeble minds more readily astray from the straight path of virtue than to imagine that the soul of animals is of the same nature as ours. Uh, and that consequently we have nothing to fear or hope for after this life, any more than have flies or ants. Interesting that he would choose insects and not, you know, for instance, let's say a a, a lion or a, a dog, a more complex, uh, you know, mammal. Uh, instead, when one knows how much they differ, one can understand much better the reasons which prove that our soul is of a nature entirely independent of the body, and that consequently it is not subject to die with it. Then, since one cannot see other causes for its destruction, one is naturally led to judge from this that it is immortal. All right, so uh, this is very different. We're going to see from, let's say, Aristotle, because Aristotle, um, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to say that an animal doesn't have language. It's another thing to say that an, an animal does not have a soul. Um, Aristotle does not say that an animal does not have a soul. Um, let, let's look at the Aristotelian definition. He says, nothing is nourished, this is Aristotle, which does not have a share in life. Since nothing is nourished, which does not partake in life, what is nourished will be in sold body insofar as it is in sold. What nourishes is the primary soul. What is nourished is the body which has this soul. All right, so um, let's see then. Uh, let me read Derrida on this same question. He's going to say, the, uh, and he's going to be, uh, you know, commenting on where we are at this point in history as opposed to say what how Aristotle might have thought of the animal. Uh, the annihilation of certain species is indeed in process, Derrida observes, but it is occurring through the organization and exploitation of artificial, infernal, virtually indeterminable survival in conditions that previous, and here's the key phrase I'd like you to focus on, in conditions that previous generations would have judged monstrous outside of every proper norm of life to uh, proper to animals. And so there, I think Derrida is quite uh, correct here uh, that, you know, previous generations certainly would have looked with, in horror at the advent of factory farming. It is precisely the thinking of Descartes that leads to uh, this uh, th- this possibility. This is this is one reason why, as well, 
um, I think that uh, we need to, um, you know, consider that, um, you know, um, I mean, it's, 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 well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something that we need to uh, think about carefully. Okay. Um, I, 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 this is, I want to review here for just a minute, uh, the differences between um, innate ideas in Descartes versus in Chomsky. And this, this will give us just a kind of a, a, a quick review of the concepts that we've been focusing on so far. Now we've made that we've, we've talked about differences between innate ideas. We've talked about adventitious ideas. I'd like you to, I'm, I want to come back to these terms, keep them in your uh, memory. Um, Descartes going to say, and adventitious ideas are sensory or path dependent. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. They enter the body in the realm of becoming. Innate ideas are, by contrast, metaphysical. They're present, absent ideals in the realm of being beyond the five senses. So we've said man has rational thoughts. Animals have mere curiosity. Like you think of, for instance, a dog who follows a scent or a sensual trace or impression. So you can say, well, again, we've said, you know, man does philosophy. Man thinks thoughts. Animals can be curious. Uh, like if you have a dog and it you know, follows a scent uh, and, and as it's walking, like, like I take my dog out every day for a walk and he stops and smells different places. He leaves his own traces uh, for other animals to smell. Now that for Descartes is a kind of a, uh, an idea, uh, but it's not a rational idea. It's a, it's, it's a path dependent sensory idea. So uh, like a, a dog can, in, out of curiosity, follow a trail. But that doesn't mean for Descartes that a dog thinks thoughts. Okay. Now here is the uh, the, the the formal definition of these. These are in, not in the discourse on method, but in the third meditation. Um, Descartes says, "Now of these ideas, some seem to be innate, metaphysical, transcendent, or transcendental, hardwired in the brain, archetypal." I mentioned that because, for instance, in the in the thinking of Carl Jung, it comes. You know, it's very much uh, indebted to this notion of the innate, innate idea and archetype is a kind of innate idea. And it's very similar to Chomsky's UG because it's, um, it's, it's hardwired in evolutionary terms in, into the brain. Okay. And those of you who are Peterson fans, Peterson is a, uh, Jordan Peterson, that is, is, is a, uh, is a union thinker and, and it has this, uh, and much of his thought implies these uh, uh, archetypes. Okay, uh, other advent, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, other adventitious, sensual, path dependent, uh, empirical, and come to us from outside. And yet others have to have been made and invented by me. As it should be others, excuse me. Others' ideas are advantageous. Others are path uh, have been invented by me. For the faculty which I have of conceiving and what is called in general a thing or a truth or a thought seems to me to derive from nowhere else than my own nature. But if I now hear a noise, if I see the sun, or if I feel heat up to now, I have judged that these sensations came from certain things existing outside of me. And finally, it seems that sirens, hippographs, and all other similar chimera are fictions and inventions of my mind. I have there a picture on the left, a, one of these fantastic uh, beasts, a hippogriff, which he, this, this is, uh, you know, what he's saying that these, these are things that I can invent in my mind, but they have no real uh, reality. So it's not, it's different from the innate idea and from the uh, idea that like the dog smelling the, uh, uh, you know, the trail. Okay. So now that we've talked a little bit about uh, Descartes' views, and I think they should be clear at this point. And, and his views on the logos and how it's the seed inserted into the animal. I'd like to take just a few minutes and compare the thinking of Descartes to the thinking of Chomsky. And you can see here, here's Mr. Chomsky. Here is his book, Cartesian Linguistics, published in 1966. So this is one of his earlier texts. Um, it's, it's a short text, uh, and it has a, it has a very well written introduction by a, a uh, a, a, a someone who really appreciates Chomsky's thought, James McGilvray. And so I always recommend when students want to approach these questions, I say, I tell them, well, read Chomsky's Cartesian Linguistics, because this is the place where you see him in a more forthright way, engaging the thought of philosophers and there's, and, and, and coming at, at some of these questions from, from a, 
a, a philosophical perspective as opposed to the posturing that, op- that we often see in his writing where he wants to call you know linguistics biolinguistics and make you know claims that what he's doing is similar to chemistry and that he's a kind of a bio uh, linguist um, rather than a philosopher of language uh, and uh, and so I, I say well ha- I always tell students well ha- have a look at this text. Um, this is a good place to begin. You can thereby situate Chomsky's work in the, in the history of Western philosophy. Okay. Now, uh, here you'll find Chomsky, you know, defining also universal grammar. So this is a term he always like. He likes to use these little, for like, you know, abbreviations like UG for universal grammar. Um, but let's be, let's try to be clear on what it is. And I think if you keep uh, in mind, the idea, the the uh, question of you know the reason as we've articulated it in Descartes, well even you know preceding that in in uh, Plato, thinking of logos as a seed planted in the head, thinking of Descartes' pursuit of of the rational faculty in the pineal gland in the brain, Chomsky's thought comes straight out of this. But what we're going to see also is that Chomsky is going to want to evade uh, the the metaphysical implications of uh, of Descartes' thought, and he's also going to, um, um, <clears throat> you know, want to insist uh, very vehemently that what he's doing is not philosophy, not metaphysics, but uh, but science. And so the qu- one question you have to ask yourself as we're going through this material is, uh, to what extent does he uh, succeed in evading the, the basic you know questions of metaphysics or can his thought pretty easily be situated in the history of Western philosophy and can he be, be construed as a metaphysical uh, philosopher okay and we're also going to need to ask ourselves when both Plato Plato's going to say God puts the seed of reason into the brain and uh, in Descartes the same thing is really true we, we don't get the soul the, 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 these ideas that, that, uh, uh, that are innate. That, that the only way that that they're there is because is because God put them there. Now, as a an alleged scientist, uh, uh, Chomsky's going to need to somehow uh, account for how the reason got into the head, or how UG got into the head, without recourse to theology. Uh, so this raises the question: If God didn't put it there, if there, if God is irrelevant to the proposition, because after all, what we're doing is science and not theology. How then did uh, UG get there? Okay, so this is something we'll want to work on. Okay, so let's look at what Chomsky's definition of UG or universal grammar. So he's gonna say it's an organ in the brain that is hardwired in the genome. Now the genome is the, the complete set of genetic material present in a cell. And so each time we hear this word genome in Chomsky's thought, if UG is hardwired in the genome, I think you can, we might also think of the genome as akin to this, uh, what we've been talking about in Descartes with the pineal gland. Uh, and, and you can cl- clearly see the parallels. They're not, just, I'm not saying they're identical, but, but you can clearly see where, uh, upon whom Chomsky is dependent in articulating this theory. And then, it, and he's going to say it's also that it is as real as the liver. This is a claim that he makes. Um, this is an organ in the, in the brain that is as real as the liver. Uh, but as we said previously, you can't, you can't, uh, you can actually empirically, you know, uh, observe a liver, hold it in your hand, study it with in the case of universal grammar. Uh, it, it's, it's a, it, it's an organ that is presently absent or that does not appear that can't be situated in, in the framework of, of, uh, appearance. Um, it, it doesn't make itself available as an object of, of appearance. It has to be represented or represented like, uh, reason in Leibniz's principle. Okay, so uh, let's continue. It, it, it is as real as the liver, although merely a hypothesis at the same time, because it is empirically unavailable, unavailable to human perception. That is, it, it, UG can only be asserted as a thesis. Um, epiphenom- epiphenomena of spoken utterances and written inscriptions. This is what he called uh, Chomsky calls the epiphenomena. Uh, these are this you know speaking and writing. And our speaking and writing is a representation of UG. We've already seen this in Plato. This is a, sort of a rehashing uh, of the Platonic idea that words, that the spoken word is a copy of the logos, or written word is a copy of a copy of a logos. But this is what Chomsky is calling linguistic, you know, competence, the external representation of UG. 
And the epiphenomenon that is truly spoken is a competent representation of UG. Okay, now uh, we, here's our old friend, the homoculus, which we've talked about previously. We think of the genome and, and, uh, similar to the homoculus. Now this may seem an unkind uh, a way of laughing at Chomsky, but this is actually Chomsky himself who makes the uh, equivalency. Okay, here's, let's quote Chomsky. Chomsky can say, on the conceptual intentional system, and, this, and the sensory motor system of human language is going to say this. We know that somehow there's a homoculus out there who's using the entire sound and the entire meaning systems. That's the way we think and talk. Well, you know, as we've seen in our reading of Plato, the homoculus is a very, very old idea. It's one that doesn't have much credibility in any scientific sense, uh, but Chomsky's going to refer to it. Um, we, you, one thing, you know, Chomsky uses many of these kinds of traditional metaphors in the history of, of philosophy that have been used over and over again, like the metaphor, the metaphor of the mirror, the, you know, spoken language mirrors, the you know, universal grammar. But each time uh, Chomsky's pressed on the question of his use of metaphors, he backs off and will say, well, it's not to be taken too literally. So we see this sort of literal figurative problem in his thought, you know, because again, he, since he's talking about something that's not available, he has to use recourse to metaphors, uh, much like Plato has to use recourse to metaphors when talking about the logos as fire, seed, oyster, and so on, and the oyster cell when he's talking about the soul. Uh, but uh, this is the metaphor indeed that Chomsky himself uses, okay? Uh, similarly, he'll speak of those who don't have language like animals, he'll compare them to eunuchs, uh, men who have been, you know, castrated, who have no testicles. Uh, they say, there we have again this sort of like, is Chomsky a fallow logocentric thinker? Well, by his own, uh, we're just reading what he himself says. Uh, here's Chomsky, the most severe disability of wit under which men differ not from brute beasts, and here he's quoting, quoting Warren Hart, is the disability which very much resembles that of eunuchs unable for generation that prevents the rational faculty from arriving at the first principles of all arts implanted in the scholar's mind before he began to learn. Now this is, he's quoting from Juan Hart. He's quoting here the, the, the part that you can see in quotations there, but he's quoting approvingly. And so here we find him in addition to the homoculus using this uh, example of a person who is unable to speak as being like a eunuch. They are lacking in this fallow logocentric seed. Uh, or this uh, 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 rational faculty in the pineal gland in Cartesian terms. Okay, one thing when you're reading Chomsky, I would also urge you to be aware of is his reliance on a rhetorical trope of solepsis or a uh, zygma. Uh, now this is, um, these are two different terms, you can look them up, but a, a zygma is a yoking together, literally etymologically, the solepsis is a taking together uh, definition uh, of this of these terms. There, there's some slight differences between them, but they're not important for our purposes. As a formal trope, which consists of taking one and the uh, one uh, and the word, one word and the, and the word and two different, excuse me, uh, I must have misspelled something there, left something out, but taking one and the word in two different senses, one of which is supposed to be the original, one word which is supposed to be the original, or at least the literal meaning, and the other is the figurative or at least supposedly the figurative meaning. Okay, I'll give you an, an instance of this we're gonna come back to in Derrida's, for instance, in his Spectres of Marx, when he criticizes Fukuyama, one of the things that he notes is that Fukuyama will use this word democracy, and sometimes when he uses the word democracy, he means it uh, literally as in, you know, democratic states today, like say a liberal democratic state, like, you know, Holland or France, um, and sometimes he means the democratic as the ideal or the figure. So, you know, when you're reading, you know, Fukuyama, you can't be sure. Is he, does he mean the literal? Does he mean an actual democratic state today? Or does he mean the ideal democratic state? This is this sort of oscillation or sliding back and forth between the literal and the figurative use of the term. And this is something as well that is, is a common feature of, of Chomsky's uh, thought. So you have to be kind of careful about it. It's one of the things that makes reading him sometimes uh, confusing. Okay, so let me show you an instance of this. Here's, here's from his sound pattern of English. Chomsky's going to say, we use the word grammar to refer to both the system of rules represented in the mind of the speaker hearer 
And to the theory, uh, the linguist constructs as a hypothesis. But, he, but then he's going to state kind of strangely, no confusion should, should result from this standard usage if this distinction is kept in mind. And so it's a deliberate, you know, uh, you know, uh, sliding back and forth that that makes his text sometimes really, uh, uh, you know, confusing. And you have to sort of stop and unpack what's going on in them. Um, I also, I would note the Chomsky's use of catachresis. This is another. Uh, this is another term from rhetoric. Again, we're reading philosophy. We're reading all of these texts as literature. So we're going to look at some of the rhetorical tropes in them as well. And you know, catachresis is is a, is a useful term. Uh, if you're doing, you know, uh, rhetoric or literary theory, this is a term that means the violent repetition of a word or trope in order to produce meaning. Um, so I, let me give you one instance of this. Chomsky likes to, or two instances here, Ch Chomsky likes to use this expression, the mind brain. He also uses this idea of unconscious knowledge that is repeated. Now, let's start with, for instance, unconscious knowledge, which is literally the unknown known. Uh, it's obviously vulnerable to deconstruction because there we have uh, two, uh, you know, sort of it's an oxymoronic uh, formulation, uh, but uh, Chomsky will use it repeatedly. Similarly, we think of he'll, he'll use the expression mind brain, which is a conflating uh, like as if it's one thing, but it's a conflation of the mind, which is an abstract concept and the brain, which is an actual real uh, organ. But they come to be seen as one of one and the same, and, and then uh, he will build upon these uh, catacrat, catac catachristic uh, terms, and uh, you have to be kind of uh, careful about that. Okay, so now let's let's come back to this question I raised earlier: How did universal grammar get in your head, according to Chomsky? Well, as we've seen, as I've already said, Descartes, like Plato, claims that God put it there. God put reason, this logos, common sense, language, a seed in, in our heads, this fire in the middle of the armillary sphere. Uh, but if neo-Cartesian Chomsky and linguistics is a matter of science or biolinguistics, how did universal grammar come to be lodged in the genome in Chomsky's uh, uh, paradigm? Or how did language come to be an organ in our brain that is as real as the liver? Okay, well, Chomsky uh, tells us this, uh, how. Uh, he has this little story, I, I, call, it, I call it the cosmic, cosmic ray theory. It's the story of a cosmic ray that scrambled the brain. It's very akin to, I, I think it's uh, somewhat akin to, if, if you've read this uh, interesting book by uh, Michael Pollan on, what is it, on the uh, mushrooms. I'm sorry, I can't remember the title, uh, but I read in that a story of, it's called The Stoned Ape. And uh, Chomsky's, uh, Cosmic ray theory is sort of like the stoned ape. Like there was an ape that ate a hallucinogenic mushroom, and maybe that's where language came from. That's one kind of funny theory out there, although some people take it quite seriously. Uh, Chomsky's uh, view is going to be that there was some kind of cosmic event. It wasn't God uh, planting any seed in our head, but this, but some something happened that scrambled around what uh, you know the organs in our brains. Uh, in, in a sense that that entered into our heads through some kind of in, in some kind of path dependent way that then became a kind of transmitted from one human being to another. All right. Well, all right. So here's here's uh, his way he articulates this to clarify the problem of design uh, design specifications. Let us invent an evolutionary fable, keeping it highly simplified. Imagine some primate with the human mental architecture and sensory motor apparatus in place, but no language organ. It had our modes of perceptual organization, our propositional attitudes, beliefs, desires, hopes, fears, insofar as these are not mediated by language, and perhaps a language of thought, but no way to express its thoughts by means of linguistic expressions so that they remain largely inaccessible to it and to others. Uh, some event reorganizes the brain in such a way to insert FL, which he calls the language faculty. To be usable, the new organs had to meet certain legibility conditions. Or here's another version of the same tale from the architecture of language. He's going to say, to tell a fairy tale about UG, it is almost as if there was some higher primate wandering around a long time ago, 
and some random mutation took place, maybe after some strange cosmic ray shower, and it reorganized the brain, implanting a language organ in an otherwise primitive brain. Okay, now there's also, you know, speculation, McGilvray will talk more about this as well. Like maybe some uh, woman, it was, I don't know why it's a woman, but I think I, it's a woman that in, in the paradigm that I read. Uh, and she caught, basically, it's like a, a language virus. She caught a language virus. Uh, animals, for some reason, could not catch the virus. And so it wasn't able, you weren't able to spread it to other animals. But language essentially is a kind of a viral uh, you know, something that is, that is spread like a virus, you know, much like the uh, coronavirus that we're all uh, uh, thinking about right now. Um, so, or, or take William S. Burroughs, who, who thinks of words as viruses. There's a kind of a, a similarity here in that, you know, that it's like a vi words are like poisonous viral infections that spread from one person uh, to uh, another. After the after this cosmic event has taken place in this theory, okay, uh, here's the way McGilvray, who writes the introduction to Cartesian linguistics, puts it. He's a, a alkalite of uh, Chomsky. Plausibly, a capacity to engage in distinctively human forms of cognitive behavior, art, religion, empirical investigation, came about not only suddenly by evolutionary standards but as the result of the introduction of a single change, an introduction to language, more precisely recursion, and specifically the capacity to put concepts together to produce an indefinitely large number of concepts to be used freely is the probable cause. Uh, if Chomsky's story is plausible, a humanoid species in effect became human as the result of the introduction of language. Okay, now uh, what what we're really talking about here then is, is is Chomsky's views are evolutionary, but they're not evolutionary in a Darwinian sense. They're more in, in, in a Lamarckian sense. Uh, this is you can see here an image of Jean Baptiste Lamarck from who lived from 1744 to 1829, and he's the one who had the theory of the precocious giraffe and this is the like for instance that the giraffe was able to in, in, in because of the need the necessity to eat the higher branches on the tree mutated uh, at a very in, in quick spurts in order to be able to reach those branches and so this would be chomsky's views about the language mutation would be not like those of darwin but like those of lamarck in which these this this sort of sudden event took place and so an, an event took place in the brain but it was not a matter of god endowing man with reason or with language it could it, it can be explained in in uh, uh in terms of chemistry even but not uh but but the, but it's speculative because these are all hypotheses that uh chomsky is is uh, casting about uh, but um Ultimately, as he himself acknowledges, he doesn't know where it came from any more than Plato or, uh, you know, Descartes. So he's compelled to tell a, a fairy tale or a story uh, about its origins, which makes, interestingly enough, the bilinguistic uh, thinker Chomsky, the brain scientist here, becomes a kind of a, a spinner of yarns, much like Homer uh, and, and, and the bards of old. Okay. Uh, so let's also note as well that Chomsky's innate idea, UG, is in fact an adventitious or path dependent or quasi innate idea since it enters the body via the senses rather than being inserted by God. And this, this is really kind of a crucial point to, to reflect upon is that, is that while Chomsky on the one hand sort of pulls the Cartesian doctrine of innate ideas out of the ash bin of history where they had been consigned by figures like, you know, uh, you know, Locke and Hume and, and Kant and had been sort of effectively forgotten for several hundred years. Uh, he sort of dusts them off and, and, and retools them. But, but even his uh, innate ideas really aren't innate ideas at all. Um, they're, they're quasi innate ideas because, in fact, at the end of the day, if, if they weren't, you know, inserted by any sort of, you know, greater being, if they came about, you know, through some sort of external uh, entry or, or path, a sensory pathway, um, then the innate idea is a quasi innate idea or path dependent 
idea or, or an idea that seems to be innate, but in fact is not innate. But but uh, uh, this is something I think that Chomsky is, is aware of, but he likes to keep the distinction uh, anyway. But it's one that is often lost upon his uh, readers. Okay. Um, like innate ideas in Plato and Descartes, uh, it nonetheless remains unavailable, e.g., to empirical observation. As we said, and like the innate idea in Plato and Descartes, it is presently absent and hypothetical. Chomsky's thought, like Descartes, is also deductive or thetic. It, it, it's a matter of assertion of a thesis, the thesis of UG's existence. Uh, like Descartes' cogito and uh, innate ideas, um, UG, uh, uh, excuse me, I can't see it there. UG uh, has to be asserted as a thesis. 